right, this is CS50 and this is the end of week two. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there with you all today, but you're in very good hands. Allow me to introduce CS50's own Rob Bowden. <laughs> and of course, then we have to make fun of the fact that he sent us a vertical video and show this. <laughs> This video didn't have to look this way. It could have been prevented. Say no to vertical videos. Vertical videos happen when you hold your camera the wrong way. Your video will end up looking like crap. <laughs> there are more and more people addicted to making vertical videos every day. It's not crack or nothing, but it's still really bad. There are two different kinds of people who are afflicted with VVS. The first group treats the videos they shoot like pictures. They don't mean any harm. They just don't understand that while you can turn a picture, you can't really turn a video. <laughs> the other group is people who don't give a shit. Vertical video syndrome is dangerous. Motion pictures have always been horizontal. Televisions are horizontal. Computer screens are horizontal. People's eyes are horizontal. We aren't built to watch vertical videos. I love vertical videos! Nobody cares about you! If this problem's left unchecked, YouTube will begin showing four videos at once, just to save bandwidth. Leatherboxed vertical videos would be the size of a postage stamp. And it will spread everywhere. Movie screens have always been horizontal. If vertical videos become accepted, movie theaters will have to be tall and skinny. And all the movie theaters would have to get torn down and rebuilt. And by the time they were rebuilt, Mina Kulitz would be old and ugly. And birds will crash into them and die. And we will all get stiff necks from looking up. And no one will sit in the front row ever again. And George Lucas will re-release Star Wars again. The skinny edition. I was never really able to tell the story that I wanted to tell. This was a great chance for me to experiment with a new technology. You're a jerk. Every time a mobile device is used to record video, the temptation is there. Just say no. Say no to George Lucas. Say no to old Mila Kunis. Say no to vertical videos. And if you see someone doing it, say, You're not shooting that right, dummy! Okay, so on Monday you were promised Ovaltine. Uh, unfortunately, when you leave class today, we don't have Ovaltine out there to serve you all. Uh, but this does relate to the cryptography piece that that's coming up. So how does it relate? Well, first let's talk a bit about cryptography. So in this problem set, you're going to be implementing a very simple form of cryptography, which is basically the encryption and decryption of secret messages. So here we have a very simple toy. And the idea is the, the outer ring rotates around the inner ring. And you can see, maybe if I zoom in, that it's hard to see, but like the number one, well, that moved. <laughs> the number one maps to the letter X. The number two maps to the letter J. Incredibly difficult not to skip forward. Uh, letter two maps to J. Uh, number three maps to D. So with this ring, you can give someone a message, one, two, three, for some reason you want to tell them X, J, D. Uh, but you can give them some message of numbers, and as long as they have this ring, they can decrypt what you're trying to say. So we, you may have seen this particular example of cryptography before. If around the Christmas season you've watched A Christmas Story, if you've never seen it before, then uh, just turn on TBS at literally any time on Christmas Eve, because they just show it back to back to back to back to back the entire day. And the relevant video is this. Be it known to all and sundry that Ralph Parker is hereby appointed a member of the Little Orphan Annie Secret Circle and is entitled to all the honors and benefits occurring there too. Signed, Little Orphan Annie. Countersigned, Pierre Andre. In ink. Honors and benefits already at the age of nine. Come on. 
Come on, let's get on with it. I don't need all that jazz about smugglers and pirates. Listen tomorrow night for the concluding adventure of the Black Pirate Ship. Now it's time for Annie's secret message for you members of the Secret Circle. Remember, kids, only members of Annie's Secret Circle can decode Annie's secret message. Remember, Annie is depending on you. Set your pins to B2. Here is the message. 12, 11. I am two, in my first eight, secret meeting. Five, 14. 11, 18, 16. Oh, Pierre was in great voice tonight. 12, I could tell that tonight's message was really important. 3, 25. That's a message from Annie herself. Remember, don't tell anyone. Seconds later, I'm in the only room in the house where a boy of nine could sit in privacy and decode. <laughs> Aha, B. <laughs> I went to the next. E. The first word is B. S. It was coming easier now. U. <laughs> Two, oh, come five, on, Ralphie. I got it. I'll be right there, Ma. Oh, be sure to, be sure to what? What was the little orphan Annie trying to say? Be sure no, to what? Annie has got to go. Will you please come out? All right, Ma, I'll be right out. I was getting closer now. The tension was terrible. What was it? The fate of the planet may hang in the balance. No, Annie's gotta go. I'll be right out. Let's find out loud. She <laughs> almost there. My fingers. My mind was a steel trap. Every pore vibrated. It was almost clear. Yes, 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 yes. Be sure to drink your Ovaltine. Ovaltine? A crummy commercial? Son of a bitch. So that's how Ovaltine relates to cryptography. Uh, basically, CS50 has just advertised Ovaltine, so we could be a crummy commercial for Ovaltine. All right, so now actual computer science. Uh, remember, on Monday, we left off diving deeper into strings. So we were dealing with the strings of Mila, and we were recognizing the fact that we can treat the Mila as a sequence of characters. And remember that we learned the bracket notation. So if this were stored in a string S, then if we said S bracket zero, that would indicate the letter capital Z. If we said S bracket one, that would indicate lo the first lowercase a, and so on. Up to S bracket five, which would indicate the last a. Now remember that the length of this string is six, but the indices into the string uh, are zero through five, Z through that last a. So this now fits into a bigger picture of your computer's memory, your RAM. So somewhere, the program that you're running, your computer needs to remember Zamila somewhere in memory. So can I have a volunteer? Yes, please. And what is your name? All right, Dean? Yeah. Nice to meet you, Dean. So come over here, and we're going to have you draw on our nice, nifty layout of memory. Now, I like to think of memory as one long, uh, one long strip of bytes, but just for display purposes. We'll just left to right, top to bottom. OK, so I'm going to show a program. Get strings.c. And so all this program is doing is requesting four strings from the user with get string and then printing whatever that first string entered was. We're ignoring two through four. OK, so over here now, when I first request S1, so you are the computer, and you are implementing get string. So you request a string from me, and I say, OK, Dean. Give the string Dean. So now somewhere in memory, you need to remember Dean. So write it into memory somewhere. Perfect. OK, so now we have S2. And S2 is going to be a request to get string. So I'm going to enter a string. I'm going to enter Hannah. So enter Hannah somewhere into memory. Yeah, 
A-H. <laughs> okay, so now S3, and it's gonna be another request to get string, and so now enter Maria. All right, and then there's one last request to get string, S4. So, I don't know, how about we go with anti-disestablishmentarianism? So enter that into memory. Yeah, <laughs> so just do Rob. <laughs> okay, so now explain, why did you leave these spaces? Why do you have this blank space here, here, and up here? So that it would be easy for the computer to tell when the one string is ended. Yeah, so notice when I go to print S1, so if we had Hannah running right up next to Dean, how do we know when the string Dean ends? So printing the string S1 may have just printed Dean, Hannah, Maria, Rob, if it doesn't have any clue of when Dean actually ends. All right, so in memory, the way we actually represent this end of a string is with backslash zero. So this space is exactly what we wanted. This will be a backslash zero, this will be a backslash zero, and this will be a backslash zero. And you can have a fabulous prize for being a perfect volunteer. <laughs> Take a stress ball. <laughs> Okay, so this character backslash zero is how we indicate the end of a string. It's how when any given program wants to print a string, it's how, remember we learned the Stirlen function last week, string length. It's how string length is able to determine how long a string is. It just keeps iterating over the characters until it finds the backslash zero character. So important thing to realize about the backslash zero character is it's represented by all zeros in bits. So notice that this is distinct from the zero character. So the zero character, if you remember in the example that he gave at the end of lecture, where characters map to, like, capital A maps to 65, lowercase a maps to 97, lowercase b would be 98. So the number zero maps to, I don't know off the top of my head, 44 or 45, somewhere in that region. Uh, so the character zero is an actual number, but backslash zero maps to all zero bits. So there's a distinction between backslash zero, which we'll call the null terminator, there's a distinction between backslash zero and the character zero. All right, so talking a bit more about strings, so then we see here, this is how it would be laid out in memory. So this idea of strings as a sequence of characters, so the official computer science term for sequence is an array. So we would call a string an array of characters. And there are actually other data types that we can make arrays out of. So to motivate this, we'll look at an example. All right, we'll call it ages 0.c. I'll copy and paste our template. Okay, so in this program, what we want to do is grab the age of three students in the course. So we can have int age, and now I'm gonna say zero, so you might wanna say age one, but for purposes we'll see very shortly, I'll say int age zero equals get int. So the same call to get int that we've been using, I don't happen to be prompting saying give me the age, but just request it. Int age one equals get int, and int age two equals get int. So again, three students, but ultimately the variable indices are age zero through age two. Okay, so this program will we'll do whatever we want with age zero, age one, and age two, but this program ultimately works for three students. Okay, so now what if I want four students? Well, I'm gonna have to go back into my code, change the comment, and now we have an int age three equals get int. Okay, so who sees the problem here? What is the problem with this sort of setup? Yeah, so we're creating a variable for each student. Now, that works, but ultimately, what if I now say I wanna grab the age of eight students, or 16 students, or the however many students, the hundreds of students in CS50, or the thousands of students on campus, or the billions of people in the world. So ultimately, this is not sustainable. 
Anytime you see yourself copying and pasting code like this, you should generally feel that there is a better way. So this is where we introduce an array declaration. So when you declare an array, this is what the general format is going to look like. We're going to say the type, and then we're going to give the name of that array just so we define any given variable. And then finally, we are using this bracket notation again, but in a different context from how we were using it earlier. So here, this looks like a normal variable de declaration that we've seen. So we've seen int x semicolon before. Well, now we might see something like int x brackets 5. And putting this idea into the get int program we have, so we could implement this in the same way. Uh, let's say in CS we tend to use n as the number of something. So here we're going to store four students. And now we can say int age bracket n, not quite get it yet, to declare an array of four students. So how this will look in memory, so it'll be similar to this. We'll clear this. And we're going to have somewhere in memory, I'll put this up there. So somewhere in memory, one, two, three, four. We have four integers in an row, in a row, for the, this array of four integers. So currently, what is the size of one of these boxes? Yeah, it's four bytes. It's 32 bits. So now this is different from the array we saw earlier, the array of characters. A string, each box was only one byte, because a character is only one byte. But with an array of integers, each box has to be four bytes in order to fit an entire integer. So this is what an array of four ints would look like. And then back to code. Now we want to actually store integers into that array. So now this is a very, very, very common pattern that will at some point become muscle memory. So int i equals 0, i less than n, i plus plus, age bracket i equals get int. So this for loop, and fixing that. So this for loop, this format, you should get very used to. So this is generally how we will iterate o over almost any array. Now, notice this sort of explains why from the beginning we didn't have for loops going for int i equals 1, i less than or equal to 10. The reason being that starting from 0 makes this work well with arrays. So arrays are 0 indexed. If this array is of length 4, the indices are 0 through 3. So through the first iteration of this for loop, we're going to be setting, in the first iteration, we're setting age bracket 0 equal to a call to get int. So whatever I happen to enter at the keyboard. In the second pass, we're setting age 1 equal to get int. Third pass, age 2. Final pass, age 3. So if in the first pass of the loop I enter the number 4 at the keyboard, then we'll insert a 4 here. If on the second pass I enter 50, we'll put a 50 here. On the third pass, I might enter negative 1, negative 1. And then finally, if I enter 0. And now remember that this was index 3. After we loop back, i is going to be incremented to 4. i is no longer less than n, which is 4, and we break out of the loop. So what would be wrong with this? Sure. Yes. So the array only has four places, which means it has indices 0 through 3. So if this were the case, I would take on the value 4 at some point. Age bracket 4 will be setting whatever happens to be over here to what I have to say I enter 6. That'll be setting this to 6. But we don't know what's over here. This is not memory that we had access to. So you remember from the previous lecture, he was printing out values of Samila, and at some point he hit this segmentation fault. 
So you will probably be seeing many segmentation faults as you implement some of the problem sets. Uh, but this is one of the ways in which you can encounter a segmentation fault, when you start accessing memory in ways that you shouldn't be. So we did not have access to this location, and we, this is a bug. So this is better. Now, there's still a small issue with this code, and that's basically that we're still stuck at four students, that if now I want to do eight students, OK, it's not that big a deal. I can go in, change the comment, change n, and now this will work with eight students. If I compile this and run this, it will show me, it, it will request integers for eight students, and uh, it will just work. But it's less than ideal to need to recompile the program every single time I want to change the number of students that I want to, want to enter the ages for. So the final improvement on this, as we'll see here, we're going to request the number of people, here we happen to say number of people in the room, so we're getting ages of people in the room, but we're gonna request the number of people in the room from the user. So this is the exact same do while loop that we've seen before. It's the exact same do while loop that you may be implementing on the problem set. So we're, as long as they're entering an n less than one, so there's gotta be at least one person in the room, as long as they're entering a, an n less than one, then we're gonna keep asking again, please enter the number of people in the room. Now, once we have the number of people in the room, so I might enter that there are 200 people in this room, then down here, we're gonna come and declare an array of size 200. We're declaring an array that's big enough to hold 200 ages. Coming down, it's the for loop that you will get very used to. So iterating over this array, assigning to each location in that array an integer. And then ultimately here, we're just giving an example of iterating over that array, not to assign values, but to access values. So over here, we see that we are saying a year from now, person percent i will be percent i years old, where the first percent i is i plus one. So i is this index variable, and the second percent i is going to be the value stored in the ages array plus one. So this plus one is just because we're saying, this plus one, ages i plus one, this plus one is just because we're saying a year from now the person will be this old. So why is this i plus one? Why do we have a plus one there? Yeah. Yes, so remember arrays are zero indexed. So if we are printing this out for someone to just read the output, then probably they want to see something like person one, person number one will be 20 years old. Person number two will be 15 years old. They'd rather not see person number zero is 15 years old. So compiling this and just seeing what it looks like. Giving some space, make ages, compiles, running ages, we see number of people in the room. So I'll say there are three people in the room. Age of person number one, say 15, 20, 25, and I'll say a year from now they'll be 16, 21, 26. Let's see that this works with an n that isn't equal to three. So if I say number of people is five, one, two, three, two, one, a year from now, they'll be two, three, four, three, two years old. So I could just as easily have n be 10,000. Now I will be sitting here for quite a while entering ages, but this works. So we now in memory somewhere, we have an array of size 10,000, so ultimately 40,000 bytes, because there are four bytes for each of those integers. So there's an array of size 10,000 where we can store the ages of those 10,000 people. All right, questions about any of this? Yeah? What if you gave it a negative number? Let's see what happens. So in this particular case, number of people in the room, negative one. So it rejected that. Because up here, we happen to be handling the fact that if n is less than one, we're gonna ask again. If, if you try to declare an array of negative size, it generally doesn't work. Uh, so let's try, let's ignore whatever value they input for n and just say int ages negative one. Let's see if it even compiles. I'm not sure. No, 
So ages is declared as an array with a negative size. So upfront, it recognizes an array cannot be of negative size, and it rejects it. Now, if we didn't handle this do while loop correctly, if we weren't checking if n is less than one, let's say we just didn't have this at all, and instead we were checking, we just grab an integer, no matter what that integer is, we de declare an array of that size. So it would probably, like the compiler cannot possibly complain now. If I compile this, so it can't complain because it can't know that I'm going to enter a negative number, which might be invalid. For all it knows, I'm going to enter a positive number, which is perfectly valid. So I imagine if I enter n negative one people in the room, segmentation fault. So, uh, uh, okay, so let's add this back just to keep it what it originally was. So make ages. Now if I want to try a negative age. So let's say there are five people in the room. Age of person number one is negative four. Person number two is zero. Person three. Okay. So here, a year from now, person number one will be negative three years old. So probably doesn't make sense. But that's just because looking at the code, all we are doing is requesting get int. Uh, now if we had had the get positive int function, or we had just simply done this sort of same while loop down there, then this would work perfectly fine. Uh, but in this particular case, we just don't happen to be handling negative values. Any other questions about arrays? Okay. So we've now seen arrays. And we're going to need to use this for command line arguments. So in problem set two, I know many of you might still be working on problem set one, but problem set two is coming up. So in problem set two, you're going to need to be dealing with strings, arrays, and command line arguments. So what are command line arguments? Now you can see down here a little teaser for exactly what's going to be happening. We see int main, int argc, string argv brackets. So first, let's try to interpret what that's trying to say. Now. Okay, so at the command line, you should be getting used to some of these commands now, and you've probably run cd in the terminal before. So if we say cd pset1, you know that that should be changing into the pset1 directory. Now, notice that you've never written a program like this before. Each program that you've written, you would run, say, dot slash Mario, dot slash greedy, and then it might prompt you for input. Now, that's not what change directory does. When you run cd, it doesn't then say, which directory do you want to cd into? Instead, you just say cd pset1, and it just goes into the pset1 directory. So similarly, we have other examples. Make hello. When you run make, it doesn't then say, which program would you like to make? You just say, at the command line, make hello. Uh, move is another example. This one, we are moving the mario.c file up one directory. So now note this example, we're really passing two arguments. There's mario.c is the first argument, and dot dot is the second argument. And then when you run make, you see that really long command line, but this is, or that really long uh, command printed at the command line. So that long command, this is just a short part of it, but now we have three command line arguments, dot dash zero, uh, hello, and hello.c. So these are command line arguments arguments that you're passing at the command line so that it doesn't have to be prompted uh, when you run the program. It would be frustrating if when you ran, ran clang, it said, OK, uh, which, program, which file are you compiling? Hello.c. Uh, what flags would you like to enter? Dash o. What would you like the file to be called? Hello. No, you just run clang dash o hello hello.c. So looking back at this, now argc, argc is the argument count. It's the number of command line arguments entered at the command line. While argv, technically the v stands for vector, which basically means array, but you can ignore that. Argv, uh, we have string argv, so string argv brackets. So this is another form of brackets you haven't seen before. So we've seen bracket notation when we said, like, string s equals mila, s bracket zero accesses the character z. We've also seen brackets when we said int ages bracket five. That declared an array of size five. So here is a version of the brackets we haven't seen before. So if this were just string argv, that would be completely familiar, that it would just be a string. Now the brackets indicate that this is an array. 
So string argv brackets means that argv is an array of strings. Now technically a string is an array of characters, so this is now an array of an array of characters, but it's much easier to think about this as just an array of strings. So why why might the brackets be empty? Like why can't we say bracket 5, bracket n? Yeah. Yeah, we don't know how many inputs there are going to be. So if we look at the Clang example, we say clang dash o hello hello dot c. In this particular case, there happen to be three command line arguments. And so the brackets, we'll see in a second, it, won't, it wouldn't be three, it would technically be four. But the brackets, we would say there are three. But now if we looked at move mario.c dot dot, the brackets, we would want to put two in them. And there are a lot of commands that have a variable number of command line arguments. So what this version of the bracket notation indicates is that argv is an array of strings, but we don't know how many strings are in that array. And how do we then know how many strings are in the array? That's the whole point of argc. Argc tells us how long argv is. So the last thing to keep in mind is that technically the command itself counts as one of the command line arguments. So cd piece at one, there are two command line arguments. The program name itself, cd, and then the actual argument part of it, piece at one. Any program that you've written thus far has had one command line argument, dot slash Mario. That is the only command line argument. So now looking at playing dash o hello hello dot c, so what is arg c? Four. So arg c is four. Clang, so arg v bracket zero is clang. Arg v bracket one is dash o. Uh, arg v bracket two is hello. And arg v bracket three is hello dot c. OK. So questions on this, and then we'll look at some programmatic examples. OK. So we'll take a look at hello 3.c. So this should be familiar from one of the first C examples we had. We would just say hello world. But now this is more general. So here we are saying hello percent s backslash n argv bracket 1. Notice, so up till this point, this is what my template file has looked like. I had int main void, and then I would do something in the main function. Now instead, once we start dealing with command line arguments, we need to state a different form of main. So looking at hello 3 exen, the main is going to take two arguments now, int argc, the number of command line arguments, and string argv brackets, the actual strings entered at the command line. So I'm going to change that template to reflect that fact. Now, at, whenever you write a program, if you don't need to take any command line arguments, then just use int main void. But now when you're writing command line argument programs, which you're going to be doing for problem set two, so now that you're running programs that need to take command line arguments, you need to have main of this form. So here, this is the big uh, usage of the command line argument. So printing argv1. OK. so. Let's compile and run this program. Make hello3 compiles dot slash hello3. And let's say Rob. Hello, Rob. If I say hello, Maria, hello, Maria, hello, Maria, Hannah, still says hello, Maria, because I'm not doing anything with argv2. Argv2 now would be Hannah. Argc would be 3. What if I did this? So hello, null. Uh, he briefly touched on the fact that technically get string might return null, but we'll get a lot more into what null actually is. But take it as a matter of fact that null is generally bad. We did something wrong if it's printing hello null. And the reason we did something wrong is, well, when I ran dot slash hello 3, argc was 1. So that means the length of argv was 1. If an array is of length 1, the only valid index is 0. And so here, argv1 is outside the range of this array. 
It was similar to before when I tried to store six outside of the end of the array. So I'm trying to out access something outside of the argv counts, and we're getting null. So a better version of this, an improvement, is explicitly checking argc. So if argc equals two, that means we ran something like dot slash hello three rob, and it will print hello rob. If argc does not equal two, then it's just going to ignore whatever you put at the command line argument uh, as command line arguments, or if you didn't put any at all, it's just going to ignore that and just say hello you. So compiling this, make hello four, and running hello four, running it this way, what should be printed? Hello you. Hello you. What about hello for Rob? Hello Rob. And finally, hello Rob Maria is just hello you again. Because you didn't really enter something that I expected. You entered more names than it could handle, so it just defaults to the hello you behavior. So questions on this? Or command line arguments? OK, so taking a look at a couple more examples of using command line arguments. First, we have argv-1.c. So uh, the comments give away what this program should be doing. But notice now this for loop, this matches the exact pattern I was saying before. We just happen to be using argc instead of n. Now, argc is really the n. It's the length of the argv array. So we're iterating over the argv array, printfing each argv value. So. If I make this, make, what was it, argv1, compiles, dot slash argv1, just running this, it prints dot slash argv1, since that was the only command line argument, the program name. There will always be at least, argc cannot be less than one, since there will always at least be the program name to run. So argv1 rob will print argv1, and then on a new line, rob. So in the first iteration of this loop, i is 0, argv0 is the program name, dot slash argv1, and then argv1 is my first command line argument, which was rob. At this point, we are equal to argc, we break out of the loop, and we're done. So this will work for an arbitrary number of command line arguments. Notice prints argv0, argv1, argv2, argv3, argv4. And there is no argv5. Argc is equal to 5. So at argc at i equals 5, we break out of the loop. OK. So questions on that before we look at a more complex example. So argv2. All right. So we're still printing the command line arguments. But now notice we have a nested for loop. So what is this doing? So. The first loop is doing exactly what it did before. We're still looping over each command line argument. But now this second loop, we've also seen something like this before, when he was iterating over Zamyla and printing out Z-A-M-Y-L-A. -A. So this second loop for int j equals 0, n equals sterlin of argv bracket i. So let's first think for the, let's walk through, let's think what the computer would do if I ran this program as just dot slash argv dash 2. So if I ran this code, then argc is going to be equal to 1. And string argv, there's only going to be one index in argv, and that's going to be equal to dot slash argv2, the program name. OK? So now uh, i equals 0, i less than 1, i plus plus. For int j equals 0, n equals sterlin of argv bracket 0. So in the first iteration of this loop, argv bracket 0 is dot slash argv2. So what is the length of that string? Well, dot slash argv dash 2. So sterling of that will be 8. So j equals 0, n equals 8. As long as j is less than 8, j plus plus. And with that, we're going to be printing a single character, which is argv bracket i bracket j. So the only i is 0. We still only have one command line argument. And in that first iteration of the for loop, we're going to be printing argv bracket 0 bracket 0. And then j is going to increment. And we're going to be printing argv bracket 0 bracket 1. And then argv bracket 0 bracket 2. So 
this is our first encounter of multi-dimensional arrays. I remember earlier that I said that argv is technically an array of arrays of characters. So here, if I said something like string s equals rv bracket i, and then I said s bracket j, this would be accomplishing the same thing. Now, you've seen s bracket j before. That's just access the jth character of this string. So with this, we are getting the jth character of the ith argv. So what should this ultimately output? Make argv2, it compiles, slash slash argv2, Rob, Maria, Hannah, and we'll give us some room. So we see that this is outputting dot on its own line, then slash on its own line, then a on its own line. It's printing out each individual character of each command line argument. And then in between them, because of this new line we're printing down here, in between them it'll print a new line. So this is similar to the prior argv-1, which printed each command line argument, but now we're printing the command line arguments and then iterating through each character of each command line argument to get this output. Okay? So questions on this. One thing to note is that command line arguments, so they are separated by spaces as you would naturally expect them to be. So a string can have spaces in it. It's not super important, but if I wanted the third command line argument to have a space in it, then I could say something like this. Okay? So this now still only has three command line arguments, well, four, dot slash argv dash two, Rob, Maria, and Hannah Bloomberg. Okay, questions on this? There's nothing special about the space character. It just happens to be that the command line treats the space character as how you separate each argument. All right, so then, Problem set two, you're going to be looking at secret, secret key cryptography. So similar to that example we saw from A Christmas Story, uh, you're going to imp be implementing some algorithms that given a message, you are going to be able to encrypt that message that only someone with that secret key, with that decoder ring, should be able to decrypt. So that is the standard issue. You're going to be implementing two different versions. If you happen to take a look at the hacker edition, now we're going to give you a string like this, which represents an encrypted password. So your, go your goal is to figure out what the decrypted password is. Now, this is actually how passwords are stored in a lot of computers, and it just stores this random string of characters. You have to figure out how to get from this random string of characters to what the original password was. And finally, after this problem set, you should be able to understand what this means. So you will learn how to decrypt this sort of random string. Similarly, if you remember from week zero, you might have seen this URL, and you should be able to decrypt this eventually. Uh, you might not be happy when you decrypt it and click on the link. All right, that's it for today. So. Uh, See you next week. Yeah.
You're 